Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Three, two, one, and we're back, and it is September the 9th. And we are talking about your fourth quarter plus plan, because yes, we know it's not fourth quarter, but it's fourth quarter plus a month. And uh, we discussed yesterday with a lot of detail about how many actually working days you have left this year. And today we're going to be drilling down more on what you should be doing on those working days to get the most out of those working days. And uh, yeah, this should be very practical and tactical, which we love, um, for all of you to employ this plan. And then this will be a great, um, I think, frankly, a backbone to your overall plan, which you can create by completing your real estate treasure map. Cheesy title aside, Mm -hmm. it is your fill in the blank, uh, fill in the blank business and life plan. So if you have not yet completed your real estate treasure map, now is the perfect time to do it. Don't just think about, um, you know, starting your new year on January 1st, right? Start your new year now. Start your 2022 planning and actions now. Then you're going to have a huge advantage rolling into next year. We ended yesterday by sharing with you a simple fact that every single business is doing their marketing and planning and essentially their uh, all their uh, their plans with regards to growth and sales and all that stuff. It always starts in fourth quarter of the prior year. And this is the reason we're running to give you guys a little bit of an advantage on that. And that's right, the reason we're calling this Q4 plus one. Um, so if you've not received your down, uh, downloadable uh, real estate treasure map, it's very simple. Just text the word success to 47372. Text the word success to 47372. And when you do, we'll text you back a link. You have to reply with saying yes. And then we text you back the downloaded uh, downloadable real estate treasure map. The real estate treasure map is your business and life plan. And yes, we're making enhancements to it and we're adding some more content to it to make it even more robust and even more drilled down. Uh, just a further proof that our products that we sell as a part of our uh, coaching programs, they never stay in, stand still. They're never done. They're always getting evolved, always evolving. So in the meantime, guys, go ahead and do that now. Text the word success to 47372. So Julie Harris, yes. we are going to pick up where we left off yesterday mm-hmm. while they're busily texting success to 47372. Mm-hmm. I noticed right. that you were on the phone quite a bit today. Any interesting stories from coaching clients and whatnot you'd like to share with everyone? Uh, you know, people are finding and refinding and resurrecting <laughs> their motivation. Yep. And so many of our coaching clients have been in momentum for a long time. So a lot of them have taken three day weekends. You know, we had a longer weekend um, Labor Day. Labor Day. So that seems to have reignited them. And I'm really excited for what they're going to put together the rest of the year. So that brings us to our fourth quarter plus plan. That's fourth quarter being the last three months of the year, plus about 20 days here, maybe 21. And we're going to get back into uh, point number three, which we talked about a little bit yesterday, but I want to make sure they get this in the right order. So before we do that, Julie, mm-hmm. you sent me something in email this morning, oh, which I, I read, that. actually. <laughs> yeah, I did see it. It was, um, well, you talk about that yeah, a little bit. Yeah, if you search by podcast, I think you'll find well, it. Well, then I'll have to go and screw up the page notes I'm <laughs> looking true. at. But do you, you remember what well, it was about. So the gist yeah. of this is, it's going to be, it's the backbone of another podcast series, I could tell. Yes, but true. it was about procrastination, correct? Yes, it was. Yes. And, Mm -hmm. And this is from the magazine Nautilus, which has a lot of interesting, nerdy scientific things that I like to read about. (laughs) Uh, But uh, scientists had had studied, you know, why do people procrastinate? And they did, you know, different surveys and studies and tests and things like that and interviews. And their conclusion was because when you think about the future you, and we talk about this all the time, you want the future you to say thank you to the present you for keeping it together, you know, keeping your act together. Well, why is that so hard? It's because psychologically people think about the future self as if it's a stranger. And they, how do they, how would they know that, right? Because they actually studied what happens in your brain. They would interview, you know, picture this person in in your mind, picture yourself in the future, these things. And they even have run some tests where uh, they would be telling a story and show, they would take your picture and they would morph you into the older you, right? And they would see what happens in your brain. And it, it is basically exactly as thinking of a stranger. You don't actually identify that well with your future self. And in this article, it said, this is why people do things like smoke. Because they get an immediate, they can identify with the immediate self. I enjoy that cigarette, but they do not 
um, identify with the future self that might end up with emphysema because that's too much of a stranger to them. It's not actually the part of your brain that uh, houses your self-awareness, which I thought was really interesting, right? Yeah. And, and so they're studying ways to uh, fix that. And there's there's companies that are actually using that picture morphing technology. And one of them is an investment house that every time you make a deposit, it shows what that's going to be with a picture of you 10 years from now, based on the picture that you uploaded, what you're going to look like when you have that money, right? <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like, it's, you know, you're going to be old one day. You might want to save more is, is their point. So- I'll, I'm, I'm going to turn that into a podcast series. So I actually remember that. That That's was interesting. Th- this the article you're describing is a culmination of a series of research projects that were done over like the past five or six years. Yeah, it's a combination. Because you and I have talked about some of those elements before. Mm-hmm. You know that, and I do remember the um, being the. You remember that software? It was an app that came out. Mm-hmm. where you can take a picture of yourself mm-hmm. or really anybody mm-hmm. and you can make that person younger or older. Yeah. I got that I think I deleted it off my phone. Uh-huh. But that app was really badass and yes. one of the things we had coaching clients do mm-hmm. was take a picture of themselves and then make themselves look like what they'll look like yeah. in the future. And it I it, I think it does kind of create this sort of um pressure. Well, it personalizes the It does. Thing, it, it does. It to mm-hmm. a certain extent, but I'll tell you what I do personally mm-hmm. as I was thinking mm-hmm. as you how did I cuz I don't have a problem and I know a lot of our coaching clients, maybe some of our listeners, they don't have a disassociation problem with uh, thinking about themselves as their future selves. Mm-hmm. Like, so one of the, and I think that comes a lot with having, um, like, for example, if you want to, uh, it, how do I describe this? Ex- the experience that you want to have in the future of how your future self will be is best enhanced or reinforced by having similar experiences now. So, for example, if you want to, I always, my, my lean is always cars, right? <laughs> so if you've always wanted to have a classic Porsche 356, and it's something that's always appealed to you, but the, you, you, you're not willing to do the work now to basically put yourself in a position so that you'll have it in the future, go drive one. Yeah. And when you experience, maybe just go sit in one. And when, if that's really what turns you on. And I remember, again, cars again. I remember when you and I started in real estate, mm-hmm. one of the, and we were in our 20s. One of my personal goals was by the time I was 30 to have a Ferrari. Yep. And uh, I've always used cars as – I love cars, but I've always used them as um, – Goalposts, well, basically. They're motivational tools. For right. You. They are. They're less or so nowadays than back when we were in our more formidable years. But that's I use them as goalposts, you know. Mm-hmm. And before I have this thing that I really want, and it doesn't have to be obviously cars. It can be a number of things, you know. But uh, choosing something that's hard to get, <laughs> that, mm-hmm. you know, that's definitely going to be something that's going to pull you along further than, say, for example, if it's, you know, you want to buy a new pair of shoes or something. But I, what I would do is to really emotionally connect with what it would feel like to have said car is I would go at car shows and I would sit in, you know, Ferraris. And, and then I would memorize, like when I was in the Ferrari, and I didn't do this by training myself to do it. It just because it was so impactful on mm-hmm. me. And so when I was in a position, if I could do what I didn't want to do and I didn't want to do it at the highest level, and this is when I was in my 20s, sure. always wanting a Ferrari, right. I just would go and I'd sort of like almost meditate or really put mm-hmm. myself in a place where I could feel the steering wheel. Where I could smell the interior. Well, what where, you were doing is you were making your future more present. Right. That's what I was doing. That's the um, thing. Informally, mm-hmm. but that's something a little trick that all of everyone can do. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you're wanting to, like, if you're trying to battle with, you know, that the weight, right? And, and we, the things that are most obvious are the they're most obvious to everyone because they're it's so relevant. And you know, I was. I was thinking about this too. If there's ever been a good excuse to lose weight, or if you've ever been looking for motivation to lose weight, look at the effect that COVID's had. Oh, look at look how detrimental yeah. it is on people that are overweight. For some reason, people that are overweight really are having a hard time if they're not vaccinated. Definitely, definitely get vaccinated with COVID. It, a vast majority have what that's called comorbidities. Co-morbid, mm-hmm. Number one being, are you overweight? Well, so there's a way to basically maybe think about your future self in in, in, in peril. But that's not necessarily the most motivational for most people. So one of the things you could do, and this is called essentially putting yourself in the environment, right, or being around people or being around, um, you know, people that aren't essentially all overweight. Like when Julie and I were driving around the country, you know, we just got back. There are definitely parts of the country that are more in phys- in great, you know, they're in great shape by comparison. There are communities that we'd go to where – seeing somebody who was overweight stuck out. You remembered it because it was such an abnormality. It was or an anomaly rather. Mm-hmm. 
Whereas you'd go to other parts of the country where seeing a skinny person, they they were the right. they were yeah. the anomaly. I mean, and it well, is it really, is about your environment. It's about right. your exposure. It's about being in control of what you want from your future. Well, this goes and to, then taking steps about it. But this is also true when you're trying to increase your financial position, or this mm-hmm. is true when you're trying to increase your relationships, or just whatever it is. Put yourself in an environment where you're surrounded by other people that are like what you want to be or like what you want to, dare I say, attract to your life. And so uh, one of the things you could do, you could, um, this just ideas, you can scale this up or down. Um, you can then, if say for example, you're wanting to lose weight, go on a vacation intentionally where you are going to be around other people, a vast majority who are not overweight. And there are parts of the country that are like that. I mean, maybe that's a little, not the best of examples, but hopefully you guys are understanding that's the lack of exposure that really is uh, the greatest hindrance to your being able to I think, uh, visualize and emotionally attached to the future version of yourself. Agreed. And, and I, I'll say that it, making this very practical with regards to money, mm-hmm. that's absolutely true. Because if you're living in a community or surrounded by people that have the same, virtually the same, and this is how most of the country lives, right? Sure. It's, it's part of a meritocracy, right? So most people live in communities where everyone essentially has the same level of education, same level of income. They go to the same places, same restaurants, wear the same clothes, drive the same cars. There's a lot of sameness And uh, if you're wanting to be something other than what you are or your environment is not going to reinforce if everything around you is the way it is and the way it always has been and you're wanting to be something different, you're wanting to uh, rise to a different level and of personal accomplishment, again, financially, well, then you have to get out of your own environment because I don't know environment – your own environment is not going to support the person that you – it's not going to support you building the emotional attachment to the future self, which will hypothetically have transcended your current financial uh, paradigm. Well, you have to take control of it yourself. Yes. Like, you know, uh, so that brings us to point number four. Yes. The difference between a dream and a goal is that a dream is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely – that spell, spells smart goals, specific, that's the S, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. It is written down and has a plan attached to it. This is exactly what you were just talking about. These are smart goals. So part of your exercise for getting your fourth quarter to give to you things that you can be grateful for at the end of the year, see we're doing a little short-term planning here, mm-hmm. is to revisit or create goals in five areas of life for fourth quarter. And fortunately for you, you've got a couple of days before it's actually fourth quarter to work on this. And it should take you a little bit of time, not forever, to work on this because it's so important. And your five areas of life are physical, talked about that a little bit, financial, of course, family, spiritual, and educational. So we'll do a couple more examples using the SMART rules, again, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So a financial goal, you know, everybody says, I want to save more money. Nobody says, I want to blow more money. It's, I want to save more money, right? Or I want to lose weight. Actually, what people say, I think, is I want to buy something and I need to save money to buy what it is that I want to buy. That's That's right, because saving on its own really isn't that sexy, is it? No, well, it's because right now people are conditioned not to have to have much of a financial cushion. That's true. I mean, it's just true. Well, it's because people can borrow money and because essentially, especially after the pandemic, people are pretty much conditioned to the fact that the government, some form or another, is going to bail you out. Right or wrong, not being political, well, just stating fact, facts. Though. It is a fact. The average savings of the average American yes. was $600. I know. It's amazing. Well, so let's say that you have a financial goal, and I wrote in our notes here, and you can modify for your own financial goal, uh, six months of personal overhead and pay cash for an amazing Christmas. So I, I added so, a so couple let, together. Let's make this practical. So sure. how do you attach yourself to having six months of personal savings? And again, let's make it mm-hmm. practical. Or are you doing this in your notes? Let me read ahead. You are, but I'm going to just make it. It's so fine. It, um, you can a, an, emo- an emotional attachment. Mm-hmm. How would you feel actually having six months of personal savings? So maybe your personal save, you, you need $7,000 a month. How would you feel having thirty-five or forty thousand dollars in cash, maybe literally in a box or a safe, so you can't wire, you can't transfer into it, or rather, can't transfer out of it and spend Which it? We recommend, by the way. Yeah, we do. We recommend For those actually reasons. <laughs> totally having money in a safe that you cannot easily get to, or in a type of account that you can't just easily, you know, go on your account no. and wire uh, money out of. No debit so, card. What would it feel like for you to have that financial security? Now, it's difficult for some of you to emotionally attach to that because you've never had any kind of financial security or at least not financial security more than maybe 30 or 60 days. So one of the ways you could just – you have to think about and start by acknowledging what you wouldn't feel 
or, or what you wouldn't feel as strongly if you had um, a decent amount of savings and cash. And the things that you wouldn't feel as strongly would be all the things you don't really want in your life. You wouldn't feel stressed. You wouldn't feel unease. You wouldn't have, you know, all the anxiety that comes with not necessarily knowing or living in fear of what happens if all of a sudden, you know, uh, there's some in health insurance premium that needs paid or some deductible or some Mickey Mouse financial thing. Your car blows up and you need a down payment. Something happens, right? You know, here in Puerto Rico, you the homeowner's insurance policies, you have to put down um, in order for the homeowner's insurance policy to actually kick in. You have to pay a 10% deductible, 10% of what the insurance company says your house is worth. <laughs> yeah, because they're not all that interested in paying all right. that. Right. Well, I mean, do yeah. you have – so these types of thoughts, well, right? Well, but here's – I think you did this maybe without even knowing. When you are attaching yourself to a goal and you're trying to, you know, make sure that it's important enough to you that you'll do the things to actually get the goal, what you said was not so much – you started out with how will you feel when you have it. But uh, when we do goal setting, it's very valuable to do what you just said, which is what will you not have to worry about? What do you not uh, want anymore as a result of having this goal, right? And you could do that with weight loss. You can do that with finances. You'll never have to worry about, you know, fill in the blank. You're not going to feel the stress of fill in the blank. Julie and I have done a ton of work on this just for through billions of coaching calls. Yep. And I'll tell you what the punchline is, the real bottom line. What everybody truly wants is freedom. Uh, you know, they want libertas. They want a sense that's Latin for freedom. They want to have freedom from the normal emotional strains and struggles that go with essentially having to earn money. And you guys are real estate agents. So having to earn transactional money, it's great when you've got it. But once you've had that closing, you've got to go and create more income. Uh -huh. So what most people really want when you sit down in front of somebody as a coach what is it that you really want? It, depending on their age, they might recognition, want recognition. They want people to acknowledge them. They want maybe they want external, you know, that type of thing. But then as they get older, then they want financial security. And as they get a little bit older than that, a little bit more mature, not always, but usually, then what they really have always truly wanted is they wanted to be financially free. They want to wake up in the morning and not have to worry about where their next paycheck is going to come from, let alone worry about how they're going to pay their bills and all the what ifs that used to chase them around in their um, their hearts emotionally emotionally are they're now basically removed because they've got a financial freedom. They've created freedom for themselves, freedom that allows them then to actually drill down more in their businesses if they choose to and make more money, freedom that allows them to explore other, um, uh, you know, interests that they have without having to worry about costing future, you know, costing them uh, work time because yeah, they no longer I, have to. I can't to do that because it takes away from the work that exactly. I have to do and I'll, I'll not like that later. Right. So Let's apply our SMART rules, well, right, and be really specific about this. Ultimately, what is the cost to you of having to earn money? What is the cost to you in a negative way? Now, again, because that's more pos that's more motivational. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it is. But what is the cost to you? It's time, it's effort, it's stress, it's strain, it's all these things. So wouldn't it be a worthwhile goal to make the purpose of the business to create enough passive income for yourself that you no longer have to work for your money? And Julie and I's definition of rich is simply where your money works for you and you no longer have to work for your money. Exactly. So let's just say you had one of these financial goals. And let's say you want six months of personal overhead and you want to pay cash for an amazing Christmas. So first you have to be really specific. It's not enough to say, I want that. You have to define how much is that. So maybe your personal overhead is 5,000 a month and you want to spend 2,500 on Christmas, adjust accordingly, of course. So you need 7,500 in addition to paying your bills. Well, how many transactions is that for you? If your average commission, this is based on the average in the country, is $9,192. That's based on our average of 385 now at a 3% commission Actually, minus 20%. That needs updated, sister. That's not accurate. 385 is accurate. I it's not. It it's not because the uh, year over year price increases was 18%. Your average, uh, it, it's no longer 385. It's now four, I think it's like 425. This was this was as of last month. That's If you want to use that, that's fine. The, the math is roughly the same anyway. Yeah, it is roughly um, the same. But the, the point of it is, is that in many, in many markets, right. people are blessed with a higher commission. Oh, yeah. Because well, so the sale this, price. this is kind of like a little mini goal, right? Exactly. Because if you say this is what I want and I want to pay for an amazing Christmas, it's going to cost me that. Divide it by your average net commission, whatever that is to you. And if you don't know, your broker probably tracks this on a spreadsheet and sends it to you uh, or your accountant. And if you're new in the business, use the national average because that's probably what yours will be. 
that's how you, you make it specific. Now, what if you wanted to think bigger? What if you want to pay off $50,000 in credit card debt, student loan debt, other consumer debt, something that's been haunting you, you're paying interest on it. Well, if you have a net of about $9,100, you'll need five and a half extra deals in addition to paying your overhead to accomplish that goal. That's a specific goal. Now you can get into making it timely. You will do this by X date and you can apply this to all of your goals, right? So most people say, to go back to the physical fitness thing, I want to lose weight. And the reason that they don't is because they're not specific about it and there's not a date attached to it. I will, I will lose 10 pounds by Thanksgiving and that date is this and here is how I'll go about doing it. Well, goal is a dream with a deadline, right? I mean, That's a right. goal without a deadline, well, frankly, and an action plan too. So when you're doing the real estate treasure map and if you want your free copy, just text the word success to 47372. But when you're doing your treasure map, you're going to write down what your goal is. And let's say your goal is to save up, you know, $20,000 to take your family to Disneyland in January. Mm -hmm. I don't know if 20 grand is going to do it, but I mean, <laughs> right, talk, talk, talk about a place to that's lose a lot. That's how big your family is, I guess. Exactly. So that's it. let's just say that's your goal. Um, so Harry, you have a deadline. Now, what we do if we we're personally coaching you is we would tell you to go online and book it and actually put down a deposit. Now, we take your overall financial picture into consideration before forcing you into that or uh, co co uh, coercing you into doing that. But <laughs> you know, coaching. Right. So if it wasn't the responsible yeah. thing for us to coach you to do, right. we wouldn't do it. But overall, that is what we would do for most of you. We would say, okay, your big thing that will motivate you is surprising your family with a trip to Disneyland in January, and you want to make this something that's going to be something people will remember forever. Da, 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 da. Okay, let's pick a date. Let's go onto Disney's website. You know, let's actually reserve everything, start putting down deposits, actually make the financial commitment. Now, how much is it going to cost? Okay, it's going to cost $20,000. You've got basically four and a half months to accomplish that goal. Now, let's look to see what you have to do to come up with $20,000. And you have to make the commitment that your backup plan is not going to be to just throw it on the credit card. Exactly. Well, I'll tell you, if you want real motivation, let's say you have a couple little kids. Tell the little kids you're going to Disneyland in January. And you will be going. And let them know. And, and then what you, again, this is, this is called coaching. We would, again, if you were a client, we would then take the um, goal of Disneyland and we would then write it on a, a couple of like eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper that were taped together. And then we'd have you create like a good old fashioned Jerry Lewis. And many of you don't know who he is, but he used to run this. <laughs> they can Google him. You can Google him, right. So imagine a, a thermometer. Again, many of you don't know what a thermometer is. So just imagine a you're taping four, a three eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper together. Yep. And then I want you just to essentially break that up into the number of like segments. And you could just draw like a column down the middle and break that up into the number of segments that denote the number of closings that you're actually going to need have happened to for you to accomplish that personal financial goal. Now, remember when your treasure map is being completed, you're now, you're going to learn what you need to earn your, per, you cover your personal overhead, your business overhead. Hopefully you don't have a lot if you're following our system. And of course, then the extra things, you know, taxes are going to be in there and the extra things you want to do, for example, Disneyland. We're going to write, and you need to earn this amount of money to accomplish all those goals over the next four months. Then we're going to figure out what that is using Julie's math, divide it by your average closing price. Then we're going to know you need three transactions or you need four transactions. And we're going to take that piece of paper. We're going to draw that column down the middle and we're going to break it into four segments. At the top of it, we're going to write Disneyland. We're going to take that piece of paper. We're going to tape mm -hmm. it to the refrigerator and we're going to, then you're going to have a family announcement. You know, mom or dad is going to take all of you guys to Disneyland on January the 15th. And here's what has to happen. I have to be able to do four transactions and here's what it's going to require. I'm going to have to be more steadfast in work. I'm going to have to focus on, you know, doing what I don't, whatever it is you're going to do. And but the, you can't do all four transactions the three days before your trip either. No, you have you to can't. actually plan. That's the point of this. And you notice that our fourth quarter plan is kind of like treasure map light. Right? Oh, I know. Okay, a lot of the same points. And by the way, you're going to also send a picture of said chart of your success to your coach prior to your coaching call. So you have added accountability. Yep. And post it on private Facebook page. Have you And know, every time you have, and, and so here's what's going to happen. Johnny and Susie are going to see that you're not working and you need to actually give them permission. If you see me not working or if you see like if I'm, you know, not actually doing the real work, if I'm not like I... I know I have to pick up the phone and call my centers of influence and past clients. I know I have to call some unrepresented owners, AKA for sale by owners. You write down using your real estate treasure map, what your actual plan is. And then if you really want to accomplish this goal, especially if you have little kids, 
and especially if it's taking them to Disneyland, for example, then you write all those things down. You show them what your actual daily schedule is and what you're supposed to be doing when you're supposed to be doing it. You post that publicly and then you give them an award system to bust your ass for not being on schedule and on task. And that would be, again, we've done this with not all co- people are going to be going like, oh my God, that is way too much accountability. I get it. You know, some people are, have differing levels of uh, commitment to their particular accomplishment but of their maybe goals. Maybe that's also why you haven't got that goal yet. Yeah, maybe. Saying. You know, maybe you're not ready. Maybe it's just not your time to actually, you know, truly do what you say you're going to do. When you know, this is it's up to you. It's your decision. But we're what what's going to happen is if you actually take this seriously over the next four months and you make yourself uncomfortable. You remove some of the nerfed upness around your life and you actually start doing the real work of real estate. You start doing what we we prescribe to you in our coaching program. What you're going to do over the next basically three and a half months is you're going to rewire your brain. And so that when you roll into the next year, you're already going to be well on your way to having new habits, a new lifestyle, and you've raised the bar for what you can actually accomplish in your life in your, uh, you know, frankly, in your business as well. This is what we are all about. That's right. So that nicely leads to point number five. What production goals are necessary to support the goals that you created in your five areas of life in addition to paying your normal personal and business overhead? Things like, this is where we're getting very specific, how many new listings, actual closed sales, buyers put under contract, price reductions. I know a lot of you guys don't need to do price reductions, but some of you do. Leads followed up on appointments set, the actual real work of real estate. So if you need five additional deals, you got to add that to what you've got to do for your overhead. Let's say that you only need one deal a month to pay your overhead. You need five more. Uh, So that gives you nine or 10 transactions. You've got to figure out what does that mean per month? Really, it's probably about three-ish deals. You can't do ish, so you might as well make it three or four, (laughs) decide. Okay, and so where are they going to come from? Ideally, we talk to you about this on every podcast, ideally from listings. That's where your deals are going to come from. And of course, your listings will throw off buyers. Those are potentially bonus deals or referral deals for your referral partners. But you've got to figure out what that number is so that you can actively go after it. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, totally. And again, uh, this goes back to what we told you guys about the other day um, was if you knew you if you if this you have a specific number of listings or transactions you want to do over the next four months, start with a question. What are you not going to do? What are you going to stop wasting your time on? And the way to have that question answered as to what you should stop doing is what do you already know will not generate a transaction for sure in the next three or four months? What is it that you're investing your time and frankly your money on with the idea that sometime in the future you're going to have done enough of whatever it is, branding, emailing, Facebooking, Twittering and twattering and all the other things you guys do. What? Okay, those are the things that you should not be doing if you're focused on actually accomplishing the goal in the next four months. You guys get it? Let alone 30 days. You know what you're not, you know what you're doing that is not working. And by not working, it here's the definition of that. If it's not putting money in your pocket the next 30 to 60 days, maybe 90 days, for sure, that's not working. If you're doing anything with the idea that you're going to send out a bunch of more emails or you're going to send out a bunch of more postcards, yes, those things have a place in your business. But if your goal is to truly help people make money, they are not the first things you do in your business. They're maybe not the things you ever do in your business because once you get good at the proactive prospecting, you won't need to. We do like digital marketing. We do like, you know, essentially all the social networking. There is a place for that. But that is the reinforcement of the real activity. You can't lead with that. Right. Right. It'll exactly. make you broke and you'll run out of time. Exactly. And now that you've heard us say this, and maybe some of you are hearing it for the first time, you can't say no one ever told you because we did. <laughs> That's right. Now, what's interesting is our more experienced coaching clients, when you ask them about these types of questions we've got in the plan and the podcast lately, they will say, I know what works because I track it. And they'll have an answer like, you know, 35% of my business comes from repeat and referral clients. And so that gives a coach a starting point. Well, what did you do to get that? And most people really didn't do that much. So if 35% of your business is kind of coming to you, imagine what you would have when you proactively go after what has worked for you in the past, right? So our more experienced agents will say, you know, 13 of my listings last year were expired and, you know, five of them were for sale by owners and the rest was past clients and repeat and referral. And my net was about 87% because I earned all that on my own. We better wrap because you got to go to the dentist. Yes, again. (laughs) (laughs) So we taught Zoe a song to uh, sing to mama that you guys might remember if you're roughly our age. 
Do you remember this song? They call her Yuck oh, Mouth. Nice. <laughs> no, I just sing that to her when she doesn't brush her teeth. <laughs> Mine is from uh, too aggressively flossing. Oh, is that what you're telling yourself? Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to tell the dentist. So, let's see. <laughs> so I get temporary tooth number two, part two, since the last go around was in Las Vegas on our big U.S. tour. So the adventure continues. It does. So uh, we're going to end a little bit early so Julie can make uh, time to go to the dentist and have her uh, tooth fixed. In the meantime, guys, tune in tomorrow. We're going to give you, I think it's part uh, three, maybe part four of this plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, And do stay focused, guys. This, we are without a doubt. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this as I've had some distance from our trip. Um, You know, I've had some people ask me like generalized questions like, what do you remember? What is your takeaway? Mm -hmm. You know, I was on a Libertas uh, mastermind today and some people were direct messaging me. Libertas is our EXP group. So if you want to join EXP and you're looking for a sponsor, Julie and I are formally applying for the job of being your sponsor. Just text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. Look, you need a broker, you know. Chances are you're going to want a broker that's going to put money in your pocket opposed to you know giving you an adversarial commission split. I mean, EXP, the old question is, is what are you paying your broker? And now the new question is with EXP is what is your broker paying you? So do consider EXP Realty. Do consider having Julie and I as your sponsor. Um, by the way, if you're just looking to get started at EXP, just text the letters EXP to 47372, text the letters EXP to 47372, and just watch the uh, videos that we put up on that page. But like the big takeaway, if I had to answer that question, because I've been thinking about it a lot, would simply be that I am more optimistic about the future of our company and our future of our country, the future of America, frankly, the future of, um, you know, all of you than I've ever been before. Because I had, there was not a, I did not find really any substantial reinforcement for the doom and gloom that, um, you know, the people try to get all of us to believe is just on the horizon. And I've, and Julie and I are naturally optimistic people, which all of you are as well. I mean, we're all salespeople. You got to be somewhat of an optimist to be that, be successful salesperson. But I, again, if you had any sort of, even in the background noise about what was supposedly happening to our country, we found nothing to reinforce that. Uh, you know, yeah, there were people that were, you know, having this, you know, we're in San Francisco is certainly different than when we were in Wyoming, for example. But the reality of it is, is there is an omnipresent sense, uh, a prideful appreciation of being an American. And I hope you guys remember that as this week we do, it is September 11th. And if you have not taken the time, some of you are too young to have actually, maybe you were alive, but you don't remember it, you didn't experience it. Others of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Do you please, please absolutely do some homework and and research what September 11th was all about. Understand that during that time of September 11th, America was under attack. And we did have just this, you know, sort of this existential moment where the United States was trying to decide what it was going to be. And the coming together that we experienced uh, then was palatable. There were no Democrats. There were no Republicans. There were no real dominant social issues that we were all supposed to be, you know, flying some flag about. There was America. Everyone had an American flag on their car. And I, and I have to tell you, even though September 11th was one day, followed by, you know, everything that followed it, what it feels like to me, and again, I'm answering the question of the people who have asked what my big personal takeaway was from that experience, 60 days on the road going to, you know, <laughs> thousands everywhere. of, yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. everywhere. Uh, it is that I feel like we are going through a similar cathartic moment with regards to the formation of what will be um, the uh, essentially a, a new, I think, much improved, um, more optimistic more successful country. I don't know how else to say it. I'm still working on it, like I said. But like after September 11th, when everyone came together and everyone was very uh, just supportive of each other, American flags and people that before weren't even, would you just disassociated themselves with uh, United States for some you know political reason. They too had American flags in their mm-hmm. front yards. There was something that changed. I think we're experiencing that right now uh, because right now we're sort of exercising some of the country's demons in many different ways. And then once those are exercised or once we're sort of basically all the skeletons are out of the closet, people are going to take a breath and they're going to say, you know what, despite the fact that maybe we didn't, maybe we've got some things that we didn't do right, you know, hundreds of years ago, the reality of it is now is that we still, even with our flaws and our warts and our, you know, 
random hairs that grow out of the side of our head. The reality of it is, is this still is the greatest country in the history of humanity. And there is no reason to believe that that's going to stop anytime soon. Matter of fact, what my takeaway was from this experience was that we are just getting started. You know, the last 300 plus years is just essentially the, it was our formidable years. It was our, is our, uh, the, uh, maybe it just now where the country's coming to the point where it's like a teenager or something, mm -hmm. or maybe a late teen. That's what it feels like to me. We're, we, this, this country is, is uh, the values that we hold, the way our government's set up, the federalist system, all the things that made this country so great are making this country so great for thousands of years to come. That's what my takeaway would be. And uh, hopefully you guys will realize an innate with that is an optimism about the future. Now, why is it important to be an optimist about the future? It's because if you are not optimistic about the future, or if you are pessimistic about the future, if you do not believe that tomorrow will be better than today, you're not going to be doing the things today to make tomorrow better than today. You're going to be doing nothing, or you might actually do things that are detrimental to your future self. So if I want, to, I want you really to drill down on that. When we talk about your present self, your past self, your future self, these are just sort of weird concepts, right? But the simple fact is, is the actions that you take today are determining what your tomorrow is going to be like. So if you are somebody who's tuning into bad news or believing the bad times are ahead for the country in any form, chances are you're going to do nothing or you're going to actually do like as in you're going to take no actions whatsoever. You're just going to sort of wall yourself up emotionally or even worse, you're going to do things that will ensure that your tomorrow is going to be worse than your today, right? You're going to actually do things that are, you know, counterintuitive, but will put you in a position where the future self will be indeed living in a reality that's worse than your present self. Um, so it is important that you remain a pos have a positive, optimistic uh, perspective. And if you can't get in touch with that, or if you don't feel that's really part of your you, just remember this. You feel the happiest. Chances are, if you think about this, when you're being of service to other people, when you feel most in alignment with your highest and truest purpose on this planet, which is being of service to other people, that's when you feel most alive. That's when you feel, you know, essentially like you're making a contribution. There's a purpose. That is your meaning of life to help other people is really the punchline here. And once you gravitate towards that, then the next thought's going to be, how can I help more people? The next thought's going to be after that, what do more people need for me to know or do for me to be put in a position to help them? The next thought after that is, ah, oh, I get it. So the more people I help accomplish their goal, the more goals, the more goals of myself I'm going to be able to accomplish because the more people will have wanted to do business with me because I've created a person in myself that those people value enough to entrust with their real estate transactions. And that comes not from trying to make yourself famous. That, trans that comes from you making yourself into somebody of significance. And that comes from solving other people's problems. And it all reels back into what's your North Star, our suggested North Stars for you is your uh, desire to feel financially free. The way you feel financially free and the way you shortcut your ego, by the way, you bypass your ego, is be honest with yourself. You feel most alive, most happy, most in connection with, uh, you know, your divine soul, your divine spirit when you're being of service to other people. So as you move forward, please do keep all this in mind. And uh, yeah, guys, we certainly appreciate uh, you helping to uh, men have this uh, continue to be the number one listened to daily podcast in the United States and maybe even abroad. We're listened to in over 60 different countries. And your homework from today's podcast is to print off the notes that Julia is embedding with all of the descriptions of the uh, of these shows that we're doing about creating your fourth quarter plus one plan and start completing it. Listen back to this podcast. Please um, repay, hopefully, uh, us by uh, giving us a five-star review on iTunes. We really certainly appreciate it when we get great feedback. If we're having an impact on your life, help us to live in tune with our mission, which is being of service to other people. And the way the people we choose to be of service to are the people in the real estate industry. And the way you can help us accomplish that goal is by giving us a five-star review on iTunes. We certainly appreciate it. Anything yes, else you'd like I to say? Yes, I have a special request for our existing coaching clients. Oh, boy. Are coaching, who are, <clears throat> excuse me, always listening to the podcast as well, is I want them to post their fourth quarter plans on the Facebook Live page or on the face, you know, our private. The, uh, the student, premier page. The yeah. premier page. So show us the pictures of what you're going to do fourth quarter. Show us your outline, your plan, your specifics. What are you committing to? I want to see it. I will comment on all of them. I want you to share it with your colleagues. And if you're not yet a coaching client, well, you can't share on that page, so you know what to do. <laughs> Go ahead and become a coaching client. Do not wait any longer.
Yeah, and if you want your free coaching call with one of our new member coaches where you'll learn about um, our different coaching programs, just text the word SUCCESS to 47372. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day, and we'll talk with you on the show tomorrow. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.